Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Devani. It's all about Total Bitcoin. My very special guest is John Carvalho. John, thank you so much for your time and coming on my show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been waiting for this. I met you actually very briefly at, um, uh, was it in both in Riga and Berlin? I wasn't in Riga, so it was Berlin. In Berlin. Okay, got you. So, John, um, I want to start off. Um, why don't you introduce yourself? Because you're the CCO. Uh, does it does is CCO stand? Does it stand for Chief Compliance or Controlling Officer? I never no, got I, that. I get that a lot. It's it's neither. It's uh, communications. Oh, got you, got you, got you. So, would you would you a little bit, you know, uh, introduce yourself a little bit? Your path to Bitcoin. You know, uh, uh, what is your vision? You know, what do you what's your comprehension of Bitcoin? Um, and what's your path, you know, to, to bit refill? Uh, that's, those are some big questions. Um, <laughs> you know, my, my path to Bitcoin was, uh, early on in late 2012, um, basically hearing about it through news about the Silk Road. Um, as soon as I started researching it, I just became pretty much obsessed pretty quickly and it's become more and more a part of my life every year, really. Um, Sometime in the, about a year ago, I joined BitRefill. I was working on a personal project before that, but um, after that, I joined Bit, BitRefill, and I've been here for almost a year now. And um, I feel like I'm doing even more for Bitcoin than ever, and I'm really excited about the future of BitRefill for Lightning for Bitcoin. Exciting. Uh, so, what's the uh, like the roadmap? Um... Of bit refill, or, you know. I mean, can you can you explain a little bit the concept maybe and the roadmap of of, of bit refill? Sure, sure. It's something that is um, ever changing as we grow, you know, and, and get information from the the experiments that we do and the products that we offer. We adjust and and proceed. But um, so far, you know, this year we focused on growing. Um, we, we've been growing pretty quickly this year. We're up to about twenty one, twenty two employees. Um, we got some funding, and you know. We, we were in the transition of going from just being a phone refills company to being a company that's also offering gift cards in, in many countries in the world, um, as well as offering now these, these kind of lightning rails services for uh, individuals and for businesses. Um, roadmap going forward is to keep, you know, fleshing out this, this line of effort. Um, we're continuing to add, you know, major product categories in many countries and we're prioritizing these countries by, you know, how hot um, cryptocurrency might be, where the trends are. Um, and we're also digging deeper into the Lightning Network experiments. Um, we're, we're sponsoring a hackathon, a portion of the, of the strike hackathon, to see if we can get some people making some cool Lightning things. Um, we have some new kind of lightning services we're testing out in private behind the scenes with some partners that we hope we can announce soon. Um, we're trying to work with exchanges on getting lightning uh, integrated and in more part of the ecosystem. You know, I could go on and on. We have a lot of plans, a lot of ideas. And it's just a matter of, you know, prioritizing them and, and getting them out into the world. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that, you know, everything, every, whatever product, service, uh, whatever interaction it is uh, with potential clients or, 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 or customers or people, um, and it, you know, um, enhances the, uh, the educational uh, process. It's, it's good. Uh, what, what interests me is, uh, in this regard is that what's demographic, like which people, which kind of people do buy, purchase, you know, those gift cards or, or you know, employ those things or give it to someone else as a gift? Do you know, like, do you have an idea who, who that is, like, demographically? We have an idea, but we're trying to get better at the at having the idea. Okay, gotcha. Um, we, we've started some extra, like, uh, optional surveying of customers when they're shopping and trying to learn more about, you know, how they got their Bitcoin, how they use their Bitcoin. And so far, you know, some, some trends are emerging, I would say. Um, one is that there are a decent amount of people that are actually mining at home or, or maybe even professional operations that are used, needing to use that Bitcoin to be able to live on crypto at least some to some degree. Um, we have people that are, you know, in some of these countries where Bit, where Bitcoin is kind of taking off because of uh, inflationary currency like Argentina and Venezuela. We have you know users in those areas that are definitely leaning on our products. Um, we have people like gamers and just internet people of the internet that that want to be able to do some things that like geographically or 
from either the banking system or even just region locks in games and things like this. It's cumbersome to do things that aren't necessarily illegal, but just like the system isn't built for it. And gift cards help people kind of bridge that gap a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, of course, there's gifts. Of course, there's people taking profits from Bitcoin, uh, choosing to buy things with, you know, with their Bitcoin instead of just uh, sell it for cash. Great. Um, very exciting uh, project I think you guys are doing. Um, so, um, John, I, I read your last article, or at least the one that you had pinned on your um, on your Twitter. Um, and I really love that article because uh, it goes to the depth of it, um, of, you know, of a lot of misconceptions, I guess. Uh, and to be honest with you, I mean, I'm not technical, so I'm going to probably ask you some low-level questions for the sake of education and comprehension for my listeners and viewers. Um, you, okay, so could you talk about a little bit what's the essence of that article? Uh, I mean, I've read it, but maybe in your own words, uh, what's the essence of, of that article? Who secures Bitcoin? Um, the inspiration of the article was that I had seen that there was more conversation that week revolving around, you know, Things like uh, what to do about when when the, the fees are, the, the system's leaning on network fees for transactions instead of the mining reward, whether this will be a problem for security, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it, it was really bugging me that people are having these kinds of conversations or having conversations about like when Binance may have chosen to reorg or what was another one? Um, the, the, the mining death spiral. And, you know, we, we have all these like FUD alarms where they, kind of, they seem to be kind of uh, birthed by people that are trying to find ways to like fix Bitcoin in, in ways that it might not actually be broken. Like they don't understand, in my opinion, the, a fun, uh, the way fundamental ways, fundamental dynamics in Bitcoin work um, to even just be making the arguments and, and raising the alarms they're raising. So I wanted to write something that kind of distilled my understanding from my observations and conversations with people over the years about how Bitcoin actually works from a security standpoint um, and, and kind of use uh, layman's terms and just make this very conceptual and not really about technical aspects at all. Just kind of basically explains what Bitcoin is, um, how we know what Bitcoin is and how we can achieve that security and what the, what the process is. And really, like I started with saying, the main goal of this was to just kind of entirely diffuse at the source any arguments about miners being like major uh, entities on the network that can control anything or even do much harm. Um, you know, I, I, I was kind of uh, going lightly in this article. I actually, theory, I, I th my theory is that miners actually can't hurt the network at all and that we just will end up maybe having to adapt to, you know, if we have a, an attack, a minor attack situation, we may have to become better at dealing with forking um, in general. But, you know, I don't really know. Um, I, this is just me pontificating. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you a question. Maybe it's totally, uh, I don't know, <laughs> not stupid, but, but maybe really naive. Okay. Um, I mean, I do hope that that more and more people, uh, including myself, I, I still don't have my own note, to be honest with you, but I'm waiting for the, you know, the Casa too. <laughs> so um, if there are, um, is it possible to overrule the validation process, which, which an, an economical note, as you said also in your article, uh, it's not enough to run a node and express your consensus. In the end, only nodes with skin in the game will enforce a definition of Bitcoin that is valuable to them. Um, now, to my question, now, is it possible to have a, like a critical number of like fraudulent nodes, as I would call them, or anti-nodes that would like, uh, like, let's say there are, uh, I don't know, just uh, how many nodes are there? Uh, do you know, like, how many nodes in total? In it's not really totally known. There's, like, uh, the amount that's easily known, which is a relatively low number, and then there's the amount that you can kind of, you know, scrape by by huh. keeping track of network traffic as a node. Um, and, and Luke Jr. does a good... Uh, I don't know when the last time he updated it is, but he, he generally does some analysis on that that's publicly available. Um, last I checked, we were somewhere in the 100,000 plus node range um, as far as ones that he could discover. Um, sorry, what was your question? 
Yeah, sorry, I got myself uh, confused with my own question. So what I'm trying, I think, to get at is that, is it possible, let's just say hypothetically, you know, to play sort of as a devil's advocate, but I just want to make sure that I, I understand it correctly. So if there's, let's just say hypothetically, okay, there are, let's say, I don't know, uh, 10,000 uh, notes. I think I know what you're trying to ask. You know, you're yeah. trying to address like the Sybil attack problem. I think. Yeah, maybe. Is that what um, it's called? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm not, again, I'm not like some kind of expert in, in networking or, or systems mm -hmm. or, or signaling or anything like this. But Sybil attacking is just when, you know, one entity can pretend to be many entities. And I think you're asking what happens if somebody just makes a bunch of nodes and pretends to support something dangerous. Is that what yeah. you're asking? Yeah, or not validating like falsely or fraudulent or whatever. Or uh, let's say that 10,000 like honest notes or, or you know, the, the Bitcoin, like honest Bitcoin notes, I would just call them. And they're like 50,000 notes, you know, just for this, uh, for the deliberate maybe attack uh, just thinking really paranoid now by nation states, you know, like they put up like 50,000 notes and they don't want to like validate it. They go totally against it. Is that, I mean, would that be a concern? Or, or? Um, yes and no, mostly no. Um, on the technical side, the system's are already designed to handle this. It's literally its job to handle this. It's just to say, make sure everybody is using the same rules that I'm using. And, and that's it. That's what that, that's what node consensus is. That's what this article is about. It's about that. In the end, only you can secure your own Bitcoin because you're the only the only way to verify everything is the way it should be is by checking yourself. Mm -hmm. And and the network and the the kind of history changes every ten minutes. So the only way you can be up to date is to constantly check. Um, now, in a situation where uh, a bunch of nodes try to make some kind of change that's not supported, well, this is already handled by a fork. They'll, they'll hard fork off if they've you know, changed a the rule. Um, they may add it, be able to add some kind of soft fork functionality if they add additional rules. Um, but other than that, the only kind of danger I think with this, this security model and the, on the civil attack level is you can kind of start to use this as a social attack. You can say, look, there, you know, if you're sneaky and, and, you know, organic about how you form this, this kind of Sybil botnet, um, you may be able to deceive people over time into thinking these are real users that want, a re that are casting, say, a real vote for a certain change. Um, but, it, but in the end, this is what the heart of what I'm explaining with economic nodes is getting at. It's saying that only people that actually have skin in the game, actual Bitcoin at stake, actual transactions to verify on the network are going to behave in ways that, that suit the value of that network. So in the end, this Sybil botnet is going to have to behave in some way to kind of exploit the other people if it's malicious. And, and just like miners, you can't really, you, you can hide your attack for a long time, but, but once you, but the only way you can realize your attack, where you can realize some kind of gain is to expose the attack. And so the moment the attack is exposed, then you'll see a clear differ differentiation between nodes that we're trying to exploit and ones that we're trying to protect the rules. Now, this may cause a situation of, of, a, of a vicious hard fork or, or a stall in the network because of a mining difficulty drop or something, you know, who knows? But in the end, the ultimate resilience and the ultimate value of Bitcoin comes from it as a store of value and that kind of uh, integrity of the store of that value. So anything that, that challenges the integrity of your Bitcoin, you're welcome to either support or, or, or totally fork away from. Um, the problem is you really wanna fork with everybody. Um, you know, you wanna be where everybody goes because migrating value to a new network isn't really quite possible or, or something that you can automate yet. Got it, got it. thank you so much. So, um, so would you say, uh, it's not realistic. I mean, this whole, all these scenarios that you just described, it's like the probability is not real realistic, right? I mean, the cat is out of the bag, Pandora's box been opened uh, 11 well, years ago, Well, I mean, right? that's what, in the end we have black swans, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> you can't predict the unpredictable. Um, but that is kind of what I'm getting at with that article. It's just trying to really diffuse these like FUD arguments around mining. Um, I guess maybe I, I'd, I'd be trans. I can see already with you, it might be transferring it for FUD arguments about node civil attacks. But in the end, you know, uh, debating these things helps everybody understand how they work better. Yeah, yeah. Especially, you know, I asked this question because there are a lot of, you know, newbies and and people, you know, even Bitcoiners who are who might 
uh, who might not understand all these, you know, integrate, integrate uh, what do you call it, intercomplex, interwoven technical, uh, you know, um, um, yeah, background uh, stuff. So, um, what would you say is uh, what what kind of process do you see for you know the node adoption per se in the next years? Are there are there any problems, challenges, or adoption rate curves that we could already predict? for the next maybe months, years. Um, it's probably something comparable to computer adoption and cell phone adoption um, you probably need nodes to be as portable as possible this is why we fight things like blocking block size increases and things that put a lot of weight on the chain um, either in throughput or in, in the database history um, but yeah I think that I like what's going on with uh, these these uh, mobile Android full nodes and, and things that we're seeing um, that maybe that maybe that's a path. Um, I don't know how secure cell phones really are, but I guess if cell phones are secure, computers aren't secure, and you end up needing dedicated hardware. I don't know. There's always some level of trust down the chain, um, and we kind of have to rely on reputation for some things. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, this is what I actually was going to ask you: the the mobile Android, you know, um, uh, uh, self validating. No, I mean, is is that something that we can you know, we can expect in the, in the years to come, or do you think it's I mean, could really I have, happen? I haven't in... used it lately. I installed it when it was first announced and uh, didn't play with it too much, but I'm pretty sure they're, they're making regular updates and it's, and it's functional to have a full node on your phone. I don't know if they have it for iOS, but I'm pretty sure you can do this on Android already. And I think that there's a, I can't remember who it is, but there's another person that was doing, another entity that's making full node capability. Oh, did, was that in Berlin where they represented that HTC? I'm not uh, sure if it was that, but that, yeah, that's also worth mentioning is the, the Exodus phone um, where they're trying to put a full node in the phone as well. Um, these are much like hardware wallets, but it's much cooler to be able to have your own node. So I haven't played with it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. you know but but yeah, the path to getting people to have full nodes is to make remove friction from having a full node and increase education as to the value of having one. Yeah. Well, since we're far away, well, it's still you know far away from plug from a plug and play operation or feature in a lot of aspects. You know, <laughs> whether it's coin joining or you know mixing coins or when it comes to privacy security, we're not there yet. So yeah, this is what. You know, would also be my wish is the the intuitive handling operation of a lot of these operations, functions, features, you know, software applications. Um, it goes hand in hand, of course. I know with with education, but do you do you generally have the feeling that um, that we we live really? I mean, crazy times, uh, uh, and, and and that um, it never was the expectation so high of um, of people um, gaining a certain degree of of knowledge of a comprehension level because you know we've been growing up with all kinds of technological stuff devices electronics but we never we never were expected to learn how it works <laughs> well i mean this kind of gets into like the whole reckless argument on the, i don't know if you're familiar with the meme in the lightning network world but we have this hashtag reckless which started as you know that be careful lightning network is not really fully baked and you may lose some money and there might be some bugs that, that you lose money if you if you try this and play with this um my standing but that but the reckless kind of hashtag turned into you know a, a multi-year meme <laughs> and you know this basically puts us in a situation where look lightning is never going to be finished and ready for grandma there's always going and and neither is technology and so a, as a whole technology is just something that is always having a cutting edge you know on, somewhere um in in the current paradigm so there's always going to be something that's hard for people to learn but We've been through this. Like, I, I don't like the idea of underestimating the human race's ability to sure. adapt to technology because, you know, it was in my lifetime where we didn't even have the internet. You know, like, right. I'm, I'm old enough to where, you know, my first computer was like a Texas Instruments ColecoVision kind of stuff. And, and you know, I remember using bulletin board systems and Prodigy Online and all these, like, old AOL internet things. And, you know, we've come a long way. You know, there was a time where people thought, you know, email would be worthless, where grandma could never use a cell phone. And 
some grandmas still have trouble, but, <laughs> um, you know, we've come a long way, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you see the, the, the challenges in lightning lightning network or like referring also to the, all these, you know, uh, problems were issued that were, um, addressed at the Berlin lightning conference. Mm-hmm. What's your um, take? Like, your depends direction? on what level you want to talk about. You know, there's um, the kind of community level where we have an aspect of kind of competition slash cooperation. So you have a lot of people fragmented trying to do similar and or competing products or, or, or projects. Um, this is both on the development side and on the product side, you know, in, on the business side, et cetera. So you're seeing a lot of overlap. Um, that could be redundancy or it could be good for competition. We'll see. Um, on the, on the network, maybe some challenges are just the speed of development. There's just so much, every time we make an advancement, you know, on, with some kind of tech on the network, there's new, there's somebody else saying, let's do this way futuristic thing, like on a third layer or let's, you know, there's a lot of innovation and it's just going to take a lot of time to fully flesh out uh, and, not, and it might never stop. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, on on the network, we have a technical issue to solve with liquidity. You know, we're we're trying to figure out how to work with um, exchanges and other you know business platforms for helping you know make the Lightning Network usable. And liquidity is definitely going to be something we have to solve. Um, there there will be kind of pseudo trusted business like ways to solve it, and there will be maybe trustless ways to solve it, and and maybe other combinations. Um, so that's another kind of challenge for Lightning Network. And then, of course, I guess you could say we have community as as far as adoption of using the Lightning Network. Um, until blocks are full, the only kind of advantage Lightning provides is to be on a rail that is instant um, mm-hmm. or or high frequency if you need to do a lot of transactions with the same person or, or people. Um, until blocks are full, it's not really going to be cheaper unless you really need the high frequency. Um, mm-hmm. so it, it's something to consider. So adoption may be slow until we're kind of in another severe bull market and hopefully we can do a good job of like steering people towards lightning as a solution for, you know, high fees on the network or slow confirmation times instead of having them get distracted with, you know, uh, altcoin scams or whatever the latest iteration of ICO scams is. <laughs> Um, do you see like, um, 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 how should I name, uh, name this? Uh, is it, is it called interoperability, interoperability, mm-hmm. like, uh, Bitcoin wallet, lightning, lightning. So people don't have to think about it anymore. It, is that something realistic? Yes, definitely. Well? It, it's already on people's minds. Um, mm-hmm. I think it was, uh, radar that announced yesterday that they're, they're doing something along these lines where, they, where they're having this they want people to to be able to have the capability to pay a lightning invoice and this is it's very similar to what we're doing with thor um at bit refill and you know so if you want to you don't need to have your bitcoin on the lightning network to pay a lightning transaction or a lightning invoice or or fill your own lightning channel you can you can come to bit refill and pay to have it done with our recharge service and there are more people thinking about doing things like this in their interface. The new Eclair mobile wallet mm-hmm. um, is, is thinking this way as well. So I think eventually we'll get to a point where if we can have the infrastructure be dynamic enough um, with, with you know, high, t- high enough tech, um, we can probably remove some of this from the, from the user and just make it so when they see a QR code, it won't matter whether it's Lightning or Bitcoin, mm-hmm. they'll just scan it and their phone will pay it. And maybe if there's an added fee, they'll have to approve the fee. Um, that, that's kind of part of the dream. And same thing with accepting it. Um, the trick is what, where in the spectrum can we land of providing all this convenience um, yet still be trustless? Um, oh, so gotcha, it will yeah. be a spectrum. So it's, oh, again, we're coming back to this, uh, you know, uh, also Giacomo Zucco and, and Adam Beck talked about with me, it's about this trade-off, right? It's this trade-off between privacy, security, transparency, comfort, or convenience. <laughs> so is it really difficult to make a trade-off? For, I think for different people, different trade-offs, is, is that the challenge? I mean, trade-off is accurate, but it's it, to me it has too negative of a con- connotation about mm-hmm. this dynamic. Mm-hmm. It's to me, it's simply just a spectrum. It's like you can't use money without doing business with other people, and so there's no such thing as entirely trustless once you start 
do, doing commerce with another human. Immediately, you're giving information to at least one person. Um, and once you start trying to network things and, and P2P things, you know, the, the privacy becomes harder and harder to manage, um, or at least you have to, intend that much, you have to manage it much more intentionally. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. I, I think that there are, there are a lot of, I, I definitely on one hand totally respect and, and support efforts to enable people to, to transact privately. But I think that the amount that there are a lot of people that they're kind of so far from behaving, you know, very, very privately um, and, and maintaining their privacy that it just kind of becomes like a little bit of a, a security fetish almost. Um, and, and so I, I think you really have to understand if, if you're in danger, if you're, you know, hiding or you're, you know, it, you may get arrested for your, your opinions or political dissent or whatever, then you need to be thinking very seriously about your privacy. And it's not a matter of like simple trade-offs. It's like, mm -hmm. what, how do I get, how do I become totally dark? You know, mm. the thing, the thing about in the current internet paradigm is once you become a target, like you're kind of screwed, <laughs> um, right. you know, you have to already have been anticipating that you would become a target and become private for a very long time. And, these are just not things most people really need to worry about at all. Um, but there are people that need it and there are people that use Bitcoin for this purpose. And we do want to make sure people can use Bitcoin safely. Mm -hmm. God, yeah, God. Um, now back to lightning uh, again. I mean, there is, we, we, would, you, would you agree? We were still for a long time to come or years to come. We are still in this store of value hodling phase. Uh, the Lightning Network, I mean, the Lightning in essence is, is about transaction, right? right? Instantaneous, uh, relatively uh, affordable, cheap, uh, you know, um, convenient uh, transactions, sending, receiving, buying, selling, right? This is what it's, uh, what it's planned for. So I guess by the time this ecosystem is evolved or, you know, will be, you know, will be evolving, by that time, the Lightning Network will have really proliferated, like really evolved to something bigger. Uh, so, do you think? Um, do you see this? Do you see? Do, would you agree with me? With is, is this evolutionary, monetary evolutionary phase that we are in, in right now? I mean, I don't think there's any such thing as a store of value phase. Um, <laughs> like it, Bitcoin is literally a store of value. That's just what it is. It's mm -hmm. what it does. It's what the purpose of the protocol is to maintain. Um, you know, that's what that article you were referring to is really about. Um, so I, I don't think I don't, there's no phase aspect as far as the store of value goes. It's, it's what makes Bitcoin valuable. And as a base layer, it becomes a fundamental thing that, that the world can build on. Um, and Lightning Network is just the first way or one of the kind of most proliferated or popular ways. There have been other attempts um, and some are still alive. Uh, but it's, it's kind of like the, the best uh, attempt so far from Bitcoin for Bitcoin, totally open source, totally, you know, non-centralized, um, that we can kind of expand this network. Um, and now we're building on top of Bitcoin. And so we're adding more commerce, retail ready, you know, uh, cash like functions. Right. So, As a medium of exchange, I mean, you know, this, yeah. this second, uh, second. But, yeah. Phase I mean, it was always a medium exchange. It was just, <laughs> it's just that we know that um, in order to keep the blockchain portable, um, that we're going to have to eventually, you know, limit that what well, we already do limit that we're, we're going to actually eventually have to hit the limit of how many transactions can be processed, even for, for people that can tolerate a 10 minute, you know, confirmation time. Um, lightning is, is just a way to kind of lightning charge your Bitcoin and make it behave differently. Um, so yeah, I, I do think it better fills out the kind of circular economy or parallel economy yeah. aspect for Bitcoin because it, it, it reduces friction on the retail and the commerce level, um, both for B2B, for, you know, for B2C. Uh, it, it definitely helps, um, but there may be new tech that helps with other areas. There may be um, mm -hmm. other layers or third layers that, you know, for all we know, the entire internet ends up on a lightning network. Everything is completely dynamically monetized. All messaging passes through it all. And, you know, and, and who knows where things end up. It can get, it become, it can become very elaborate. God. Yeah. So, um, I mean, is there, um, cause, um, um, 
uh, are there businesses out there that um, already, um, you know, ha having a positive experience with uh, with this medium of exchange? Uh, Bitcoin is a medium of exchange. Um, what kind of feedback? I mean, do you hear from businesses or retailers or merchants? Are there people like that are already demanding this as a you know a better you know a better development, a better systems? Um, are, are Some, they... you have you have to understand that you know if the majority of bitcoiners are using bitcoin as an investment currently trading speculating price appreciation even or even just as a store of value you know speculating that it will continue to be worth uh, an expected amount in the future um <clears throat> sorry remind me what your question was i had a brain thought yeah <laughs> um it's going from so what i'm curious is that uh, i mean there are uh, maybe okay a very minimal number of you know let's say globally of retailers merchants businesses that that uh, uh yeah. you know um so bitrefill kind of addresses this in a kind of roundabout way you know we're not talking to many merchants directly we have some that we deal with directly but mostly we're we're just talking we're just supplying their gift cards so we're not looking necessarily to convince the merchant to accept bitcoin mm -hmm. or even hearing about how much demand they may may have for such a thing what we're doing is we're we're seeing demand from users that want ways to use their Bitcoin to be able to either live on crypto or, you know, have an alternative off ramp to an exchange and just selling for fiat. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're meeting their demands and we're, we're answering their needs. Um, so the, the, the merchants will can, will have to catch up, I guess, because right now it's, a, we're just kind of making a whole catalog of, of hundreds of products. Um, it, pretty much worldwide where you can now shop with your crypto and you don't necessarily need to go and wait for your, your pizza shop to accept Bitcoin or your, you know, your, your supermarket to accept Bitcoin. Um, so on the retail side, we see some interest within the Bitcoin world. Now we are seeing some interest for people wanting to add lightning capabilities. Um, and we are trying to work with some people to help make that happen uh, for exchanges, et cetera. Um, but you know we we honestly aren't talking to retail a lot we don't we, mm -hmm. we see some efforts from some competitors trying to do things with you know checking out at, at starbucks with your uh with your app with your bitcoin but these are kind of mostly custodial kind of crypto theater um so i don't really know how much utility there is in say using your gemini dollars to buy you know, gift cards at Starbucks to pay at Starbucks with crypto when it's not, none of it is really crypto. It's just kind of like pretend crypto. Mm -hmm. God. I want to talk to you about, uh, yeah, because uh, I went through your medium, uh, medium page, uh, medium.com page. It's mostly pretty old stuff. <laughs> really? I mean, I want to know because I haven't read, you know, maybe I've read one or two of your articles. Uh, uh, what what kind of topics is like f high interest to you? I mean, what is it that really occupies your mind? Or, or um... I mean, I guess if you look at that that history, you can see where my interests change over time. It's not not um, frequent that I am writing a blog post. Um, I used to do more posts and more video content as well. When I used to do some interviews, etc. Um, but you know, my interests are both basically in understanding Bitcoin. I guess that's understanding bitcoin and helping other people understand bitcoin maybe also you know in ways that are not necessarily obvious or, or ways that were hard for me to comprehend so i want i want to save other people time and help them be able to comprehend them earlier mm -hmm. um what do you think uh, are there any other misconceptions uh when you like meet people or who have no idea you know who have never went down the rabbit hole of bitcoin what what are like other points that you would say is really a, uh there's urgent necessity for education or i don't know clearing up some misconception misunderstandings um i mean i guess we could talk about how altcoins are a big kind of trap for new yeah people. please yeah um, that's a really tricky one because the argument against altcoins is not perfect you know mm -hmm. the, in the end they're just trying to offer a lowest lower security version of bitcoin and we don't even know how much security you actually need to maintain x value of on it and we there's no like formula or scientific way to determine whether this chain is big enough for the value it tries to secure 
um, there are, you know, rough ways you can do and say, look, one miner could attack this network for 10 minutes and hack it. But that doesn't mean that the incentives are there necessarily. So people at first, you know, they, they kind of get hooked by seeing altcoins are cheaper. In other words, I can get more quantity of them. And this is totally an arbitrary thing, but it comes from ignorance and lack of lack mm. of information. Um, and then they see that it can be faster and cheaper and they think, okay, well, if Bitcoin is meant to be better money. This sounds like better money than Bitcoin. And so the, the, when you have these kind of really basic kind of, you know, topics and basic arguments, things seem like they make sense, but it's really not as simple as people, as people realize, and they end up falling in a trap. And the, the, the worst part of the trap is it starts with logic and ends with kind of greed and hope. And, and, and so you, 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 you get intrigued because you think you're discovering, you know, you're confusing your discovering of Bitcoin for discovering of a better Bitcoin. Um, and, and now you think, okay, well, that you have some kind of special information the market doesn't have and you're going to put even more money into it. Um, and, and you start taking risk and you start gambling and you start behaving much more like not even a trader, much more like a gambler. And, and you start justifying all of these, all of this behavior based off of like, logic that's convenient to your position um and this is a really tricky trap um because it, it's one that's been here for every uh way every wave of new adoption that we've seen <laughs> has always had some iteration of people that were ready and waiting to scam you out of your bitcoin because you're new um half of these people maybe more don't even know that they're necessarily scamming or because they're kind of they're also ignorant and they, they kind of believe some of the things too. So it's even, tr it's a very subtle thing to, to educate and, you know, and, and people get very religious and very defensive. And so you start trying to be like, you know, on my Twitter, you, often I'll talk shit about some altcoin or whatever. And I'll get, you know, a few of that coin supporters telling me that I, I need to do more research and I need to, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. I must be new here and all of these things. And it's <laughs> like, that's funny, <laughs> but it's like after, after a few years of this, you don't even feel like defending yourself anymore. You're just like, all right, I don't, this person, I don't even care if they think I don't know anything. I don't even care if they think I've only been here for a few months. It's just, it's just, I don't even have the time to care about somebody that is going to like, be a devout xrp supporter i just don't oh have time God. for that anymore xrp army yeah <laughs> <laughs> and now you know today is the uh, the the stellar army you know <laughs> everybody is so excited that stellar deleted a bunch of coins but they don't really realize that stellar deleted their coins more than they deleted their own um and it's just it's just ridiculous incredible incredible um You've been, I mean, uh, I guess you've been traveling also a lot, John, right? I mean, uh, what's Fair your, amount. yeah, what's your, like, um, what do you say, your, your perception of people in different countries, different continents, different whatever jurisdictions, where are people, would, would you say, more, uh, you know, inclined, what do you, what do you call it, open-minded um, to, you know, be, I mean, um, uh, not necessarily in our countries where there is already a need, uh, like Venezuela, you know, where there's suffering pain, uh, economical pain or social pain or whatever existential pain, Venezuela, Turkey, Iran, Argentina, you know, where it's inflation, hyperinflation, but like generally, what, what's your perception when you travel like different countries? Do you, do you like, do you notice like any differences in open-mindedness, in receptive, you know? I would say I'm probably way too biased of a, of a measure <laughs> because okay. when I'm traveling, it's mostly for Bitcoin events. So most of the people I'm talking to are pretty heavily involved in the industry. So the bias is huge. It's like all I'm seeing is people that are interested in Bitcoin. Um, we could talk about like trends for, you know, maybe say where, where a lot of people of volume is increasing at, on local Bitcoins and things like this. Um, but these are, these are more market trends and, and trying to predict them and trying to analyze them. As far as my own anecdotal experience, I would just say, I live in Romania and um, there's more people here that know about Bitcoin than you might think, but they're not necessarily like a, a large community of people mm -hmm. that are always, you know, hanging out and there's not a bunch of stores that accept Bitcoin and things like this. It's just that there happens to be a more IT culture um, here that's been here for years. And so there are a lot of people that kind of are in the know and more likely to know about Bitcoin and tell their, their friends and family about it. Um, Berlin was awesome. You know, it was mm. cool uh, being around tons of Bitcoiners and, but I didn't really get a feel for it, seeing how much, you know, 
Bitcoin is is prevalent around the city. Um, but overall, I mean, I, I think it's obvious. I mean, if you look at the last halving or conferences that I went to in the first few years for Bitcoin and compared them to conferences today, like just like we just had that that Berlin conference and it was probably one of the better like one of the better Bitcoin conferences in the past year. Um, and it's like for the second layer for a, for a specific technology on Bitcoin. It's a whole conference where everybody was super excited to be there and present <laughs> like just for a spe- one specific tech on Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, and whereas in the past we wouldn't have had, we maybe had half those people for like the only Bitcoin conference in Europe that year, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so things have definitely changed. What's the, like the first reactions they, uh, when people like, um, uh, when you like, you know, interact with them about the topic Bitcoin, what, what's the first reaction or question? What is the common question they ask you? Like, uh, is that like, uh, you know, I mean, considering all, everything that's going on right now with, uh, you know, geopolitically, macroeconomically, the pressure mounting up negative rate interest policy, inflation, maybe coming recession coming in Europe, but maybe even sooner than later, uh, maybe by next year, uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you again. I don't really talk to no coiners anymore, and I don't really, and I don't and I don't follow no coiner politics. I I, I simply Good. do not. Um, Good. A lot of it leaks into my Twitter feed or or other social conversations, but for the most part, I totally ignore it. Um, I just have no interest in the the culture of the old world politics. I have mm-hmm. no interest in in any of that that those sides of things. So I'm just trying to do what I can in the Bitcoin paradigm and see if we can't make a parallel economy that just kind of opts out of all the old bullshit instead of trying to fight it. Yeah. Yeah. No, because the, the reason I'm asking is that, uh, you know, people need that um, need to experience um, the pain or some kind of, you know, existential or some kind of questioning in order to, you know, come to that, uh, co- you know, at least come to the portals of the rabbit hole <laughs> and ask themselves, you know, about what is money? Because most people, you know, as you know, they go uh, into I mean, Bitcoin, you know. I might be an idealist, but I don't know. This this is kind of like probably a, a, a biological, scientific, philosophical question or something. But, you know, as to whether or not you actually need pain to learn something, mm-hmm. I don't think I'm going to concede to that. Um, okay. I think that if I'm going to continue the theme of where I think, you know, we, in our reckless conversation as to whether or not, you know, we're just monkeys and can't learn complicated things. I refuse to believe that Mm -hmm. because that, that, because if you, if you believe that you believe that you don't need pain to learn things because pain is corrective behavior. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? It means that I feel pain. So I will not do that thing anymore. It's, It's just adjusting, you know, out of fear. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas education is choosing something because you have information that you didn't have before and making, making more informed decisions. So I, I don't know that we need to see, you're probably right, you know, <laughs> realistically speaking and being a pessimist or whatever, I would say, yeah, there are probably many people or even most people in the world that won't pay a lot of attention to Bitcoin till they feel a pain that Bitcoin relieves, um, but uh, I don't know. We have a lot of people in Bitcoin that didn't have to feel pain. Exactly. Yeah. But because they understand, I mean, th- those people that are in Bitcoin, they already understand the potential of what is possible. Not yeah. only as an opt out, just as because we are bored, but because really we can create a, you know, a much, much freer, uh, whatever, ecosystem, society. Um, to but- play devil's advocate for your side, what I'll, I'll also say that you know, there is a pain that everybody has to feel which is being a, a kind of pseudo slave to their government. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm not some kind of huge rebel or, or <laughs> any kind of, I have no interest in playing the political game, like I told you, but we all feel the oppression of having an authority, of having to go through checkpoints and securities and scans and um, surveillance and, and lack of privacy. We all have to feel this to some degree in every single country because we all live in a jurisdiction with law and government. Um, so I, I think that is a pain that Bitcoin can tap into that everybody can sympathize with. It's that, you know, you can, you know that no matter what happens, if you can protect your keys, you can, can protect your money. Right, right. Wow. Uh, so John, um, anything else? I mean, uh, uh, any, any other projects you're working on or you want to, you can talk about like, uh, um, we have, I mean, since, I don't know if this is, is this live or you're airing this later? No, no later, later. Okay. Well, by the time this airs, um, we're in the middle of, uh, launching a shopping cart feature at BitRefill. 
um, something people have wanted for a long time, and it just makes it so you can pretty much order anything we have well, all in one one basket. So you can get a card, a refill, phone refill, or Lightning Channel, and and pay it all at once. Um, that's been a big, you know, it sounds like a simple feature, an obvious feature, but it's actually a really huge thing to add to a, a platform as deep as ours with so many suppliers and, you know, all, all kinds of integrations and things like this. So it's been a big project, but that that's going live like as we speak. Um, <laughs> and, and hopefully there won't be too many bugs and everything will go great. Um, we have a cool partnership we'll be announcing this month, probably this month. Um, related to lightning services and, and other aspects can't really say too much more about that right um we, we're continuously adding new countries with products and and looking for you know we have some more kind of experimental ideas that you'll you'll see in the future um it's just a matter of when and i don't really know when at the moment um another maybe shorter term news thing is we're not we're not totally fleshed out on yet but we're trying to figure out a way to make some content for the community um so we're we're looking at designing a content series with like videos and or podcasts um oh, exciting. about wow. cultivating a community mm -hmm. for living on crypto um basically everything about bitcoin that isn't about trading or investing <laughs> um, <laughs> um and, and so we're, we're kind of mapping that out and talking to some people about about doing that and having our own you know video content channel and that kind of thing um don't know exactly when you'll start to see that uh, this chance it could get squashed all together, but um, the plan is to at least start making some additional content to help kind of grow a community around you know the circular economy for Bitcoin basically got you so um so let me just for the uh, to wrap this up so the um, i 'll put this in the show notes uh, so any any other information besides your uh, Twitter handle and medium and bitrefill site? No, I mean the main the main place to find me is on Twitter at Bitcoin Airlog. Um, same for BitRefill. We also have a, a Telegram channel now for BitRefill that you can join if you want to chat or ask questions. Um, email mailing list. We're starting to do more giveaways and stuff, so you should probably sign up and follow us if you want to participate. Okay. Any other like um, uh, any other advice or uh, educational wise uh, suggestion for for listeners viewers? You know. Um, I guess to, to be the, the regular Bitcoin, you know, uh, curator here, I'll say, you know, uh, run your own node, hold your own keys. Um, it, it, it's easy to get very comfortable leaving your Bitcoin in the trust of another person. But lending Bitcoin is one of the most dangerous things you can do with it. Um, right. I, I don't, totally I don't care who or how or what format. But at, at the moment, you're letting somebody else hold on to your Bitcoins like they can't guarantee anything for you. If they lose those Bitcoins, they, they're probably gone forever. I mean, think of all the Bitcoin that was lost in Mount Gox. Think of like, yeah, I mean, we saw some recoveries like with Bitfinex did a really good job recovering from their, from mm -hmm. their uh, infiltrations and such. But, um, you know, that is not, you know, to be assumed. We've seen a lot more cases where people lose their Bitcoin. Um, so you want to be running a node so you can make sure you're signaling the, the version of Bitcoin that, you believe in and, and value and you want to be able to hold your own keys in that node so nobody can take them from you. Cool. Well, thank you so much, John. If you have any any other final thoughts, That's uh, all. inspirations. Uh, I think I've okay. rambled enough. <laughs> no, 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 it was really precious. So, uh, John, I hope to see you, meet you uh, in the next event, hopefully maybe in Vienna, Austria, because there is a event planned for for spring with a lot wow. of Bitcoins you, you definitely know. So let's see, it's a, I think it's a March, uh, maybe early March, but you, know, you will uh, find about it anyway. Um, and yeah, uh, thank you so much for your precious knowledge, sharing your thoughts, knowledge, perspectives, and Thanks hope so to see you soon. All right, John. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao. Welcome to the podcast show by Kei Vandavani, The Total Connector, Total Bitcoin, Austrian Economics, the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history, Bitcoin.